Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Seahorse Truths and Tales, and it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Melissa Silva. Melissa, thank you again for being here today and for bringing us such cool presentations. I can't wait to hear what you have to teach us about these seahorses. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Thank you, Zani. Thank you, everyone. So yes, let's start with these beautiful creatures that we have here. And um, first of all, as always, um, I'm a marine biologist. And uh, actually for my master's degree, I was in the Yucatan Peninsula studying seahorses um, mating behavior. So this topic for me is like very special, very fun, and I really enjoy doing this for you all. Um, so while well, this picture was taken about 10 years ago, more or less, um, I was helping the, the seahorse project in, uh, in a town named Cisal in the Yucatan Peninsula. And basically what I was doing there uh, was recording seahorses uh, behavior in captivity in order to uh, determine uh, who the male preferred on, on a bunch of females, which one he, he would select, just to um, learn a little bit more about their, their ecology, their uh, behavior in terms of uh, reproduction. So we are able to keep them in captivity, to breed, uh, breed them in captivity, and uh, that helps uh, the, the, the trade to, the, to diminish the uh, illegal market, and we can also uh, repopulate some areas este, in the coastal uh, este, shores. So that's basically what I was doing over there. And uh, from there, I learned a lot about the, the seahorses, and this is what I want to, to share with you today. So um, seahorses belong to a family of fish named Signatide. And this name means fused jaws. So basically they have the two jaws uh, fusion in one and they have this pipe-like or, or horse-like snout. Uh, the family includes the sea dragons that actually there are only three species uh, discovered so far, uh, pipe fishes and uh, seahorses. So we're going to focus in sea, on, on the seahorse uh, genus today that is uh, hippocampus genus. Um, we can find all the seahorses in a, basically in any tropical and uh, uh, subtropical water in the world. They are associated to uh, to shallow areas. And uh, I mentioned here that there are at least 46 species because actually there have been uh, very new discoveries. Uh, uh, the most recent one that have, have, have been published was in 2020, and it was a seahorse found in the, um, in South Africa, in this area down here. So the more, um, the most abundant uh, diversity is in, in this area here of Indonesia, the nor uh, Southeast Asia, north of Australia. And from there, it is thought that um, they all spread it around the, the world. So the, the biggest number of species is found in this area here of, uh, of the Southeast uh, Asia. So as I said, uh, they are associated to uh, shallow waters, to coastal waters mostly. Um, they, we, we can find them in, in mangrove areas, in seagrass beds, uh, associated to sponges, to corals. But there are some species that are kind of like pelagic seahorses, we can tell, like this one on the left, that is a, a seahorse found in um, the Hawaiian Islands, hippocampus fishery. And uh, there are some others that are found in the pelagic zone because they are attached to floating seaweed, like the Sargassum Sea. We can find some seahorses living in that area as well. But well, most of the times we will see them uh, in coastal uh, is the shallow waters. Um, as I said, there are at least 47 species of seahorses. So we have a wide variety of sizes, of uh, shapes actually. And here we have a comparison between one, uh, the, the biggest seahorse, the largest seahorse, that is the um, pot belly seahorse, 
and the smallest one that is the um, Satomi pygmy seahorse. So just to put that in perspective, um, the pot, I, I hope you can see me very well, uh, the pot belly seahorse is as long as this ruler from the, the crown, what we call the crown, that is the top of the head, to the tip of the tail, with all the tail extended. And the Satomi seahorse is the half of this uh, is the earring. It's just half of the earring when they are fully grown up. So um, a little bit of, uh, I, I will show you some of the species that I consider that are quite interesting. Uh, as I said, the big belly seahorse, the pot belly seahorse that is found only in uh, Australia and New Zealand. And this one actually has been found in uh, depths lar uh, larger than uh, 300 feet. So although they are associated to um, coastal waters, they can be found uh, specifically this in, in deeper waters. Satomi's uh, pygmy seahorse, it's found only in, in Indonesia and Malaysia, and it was described very recently in, in 2008. So very new uh, discovery, actually. Uh, this is a very famous one, the, the one that we all picture in our heads when we say pygmy seahorse, uh, the hippocampus bargivanti, and it's found only associated to this type of coral, soft coral, uh, Muricella genus. And uh, something curious about this is that once they are in, let's say, one branch of this coral, they never move from that area. So uh, researchers have found up to 28 pairs of seahorses uh, in one single coral. That's more than, than 50 seahorses in, in one uh, coral. So if you haven't seen the, sea, the seahorse yet, here's a close up. This is what they look like. Another uh, pygmy seahorse, a soft coral seahorse, discovered in, in 2009. Very uh, small one, one inch almost length. This one is a very special one, Gutulatus, long snouted seahorse, because it's found in the colder waters of the, of the ocean. It's found around Great Britain, in the northwestern Med Atlantic, and inside the Mediterranean Sea. So it's associated to colder waters, actually, rather than tropical. This beautiful one, the, the zebra seahorse, is found only on the Great Barrier uh, Reef in Australia. And uh, it's actually not very, very uh, big. As you can see, they can grow up to three, maximum four inches uh, in, in the wild. This one is a uh, uh, seahorse that we find very uh, often on the coast of, uh, let's say, Florida and uh, the Caribbean area, Western Atlantic. And uh, well, if you are uh, snorkeling or, or diving over there, it's very likely that, that you see this one and not other species. You can identify it by the, the shape it has. It has a, a quite long snout but the body is very slender. It's kind of like a, like, like stretch uh, uh, out. And a uh, Hippocampus erectus, that is the species I was working with back there in Yucatan. And this seahorse uh, is also found on the Western Atlantic. E, there's a, a wide variety of morphotypes. All of the seahorses can change their colors to, to mimetize with the environment. All of them can um, have a with like projections on the skin, but this, the is the lined seahorse is the one that I've seen that has more variety in terms of uh, morphotypes. So all of these are the same species of seahorse, but they look very different. So well, as I mentioned, seahorses are fish, but they are a, a very strange looking fish, very different from what you think when, when we say fish. So the, the biggest characteristic that we can say is that they have this horse-like head, this elongated snout, the, the terminal uh, mouth is very small at the very tip of the, of the snout, and uh, they have the pectoral fins, the fins that most fishes uh, have uh, on the sides of the bodies, they have them right behind the gill opening. 
Um, they don't have a pelvic fin that usually is somewhere here uh, on the on the let's say ventral area of of uh, most of the fishes. And um, instead of having scales, they have bony plates around the in in their body. Um, they do have a dorsal fin that helps them uh, propel a little bit more than with the current. Uh, the pectoral fins that they have on the on the head are used as a as a wheel just to, to move to give the, uh, the direction to the body. And uh, they have the prehensile tail without the caudal fin that is well ca characteristic of of the fish. Uh, something that makes them also very unique is that males get pregnant, like actual pregnancy, babies inside, and then giving birth. Only males have this soft skin, uh, the, the brood pouch on the ventral area of their bodies. Meanwhile, females won't present that uh, extra skin or, or sac. Excuse me. So here, as I said, all the <coughs> signaries have this um, brood pouch. Uh, this is a pipe fish. This is another species of pipe fish. <coughs> this is a sea, uh, um, leafy sea dragon. You can see the eggs right here in a brown, with the brooding patch. They don't have a, a pouch, they have a patch. And well, the seahorse that has a, 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 a brooding pouch right there. So all of the signaries, all of these uh, families, fish belonging to this family, they have a diversity of, um, of um, a incubation of their eggs. Some of them have like an external ovar ovar oviparity, just like the leafy sea dragon I mentioned before. But some others have the internal gestation, just like the um, hippocampus genus, the seahorses genus. So something that I just recently knew, uh, <coughs> and it was recently discovered actually, is that uh, specifically the the signatis that have the the eggs uh, enclosed either in a in a brooding este patch or in a brooding pouch, uh, they have a placenta-like structure. They don't have a placenta, so you will find, if, if you look for this information, you will see that they have a, a lot of uh, sources say they have a placenta, but it's not a placenta like the mammals uh, one. This is more like a, a lot of wrinkles inside the pouch, and those wrinkles have a lot of uh, capillaries, and that helps the eggs to the gas exchange, uh, exchange and uh, the uh, protection, like, like a cushion also <laughs> inside the pouch. So it's something very, very amazing. Uh, it's, they call this convergent evolution, more or less. And uh, well, if you want to, to learn more about that, that is super nerdy, but it's very, very interesting. Check these uh, two articles that are very recent. And you can also check this video that I found on uh, YouTube, how male seahorses evolved to give birth. And they explain this in detail a little bit deeper. Okay, so the general uh, life cycle of seahorses is just like any other. They are born, they grow, they mate, and they have babies. So uh, I consider this to be like the first step on seahorse uh, life cycle, the daily greetings and the courtship. So basically what they, they do is um, once they find a partner, they have this uh, routine every morning, every afternoon, usually twice a day, in which um, they basically greet, they, let's say, dance with each other, male and female, in, uh, for, the, for the goal of uh, get the synchronization for mating, for the actual uh, is the intercourse. So um, you will see them performing all of these movements, uh, all of these uh, behaviors uh, on the left side of, of the slide. Uh, this is more like a general way of calling them. There are more technical names, but basically it's following, holding tails, uh, pointing up, pointing down. So you will see that. And uh, this 
uh, interaction, the daily greeting uh, can last from some minutes to some hours, but, but when we actually have the courtship, when they are getting ready to mate, it can last up to eight hours until they have like the perfect synchronicity to uh, the, for the female to lay the eggs in the male's uh, pouch. So when they actually made the, the intercourse that I call, uh, it's uh, at the very end of all this courtship dance, and basically it lasts less than 10 seconds. So here we see the male in first uh, uh, place here on the, on the video. You can see the pouch is inflated because it has water inside, just like showing off how big it is, how perfect it is for the female to lay the eggs. Right there, the female puts the ovipositor inside the male's uh, pouch and she uh, lays the eggs, the, she uh, places the eggs inside the pouch and that's it, it just finished. So the females, like uh, I've said many times before, it depends on the species, but uh, they can lay at an average of 100 to 1,000 eggs. In some species, there have been records of 2,500 eggs babies actually like viable eggs and the pregnancy uh, can be from 10 to 45 days depending on the size of the of the seahorse mostly if the bigger seahorses have larger uh, gestation times so it used to be uh, we used to believe that males fertilize the eggs inside the pouch when they when all the eggs were inside the pouch and then the the sperms were uh, released inside the pouch but in reality what has been discovered is that the fertilization occurs at the very moment when the female is uh, uh, expelling or, or the uh, ovipositing the the clutch so um basically it's, kind of like an external fertilization and then the male receives the fertilized eggs in the pouch so this this adaptation actually requires a lot of synchronicity and that's why we think that they have these um, daily greetings for uh, for a successful mating this video is just amazing because it shows all the process of uh, giving birth when the male releases the fries and I remember watching this in, in back there in, in Yucatan. Um, and you can see actually how the male starts breathing faster than the female or, or than other males that are not in labor. And they change colors. They, in this case, with the hippocampus cuda that is recorded here, they change from this dark color to a paler color. And uh, in some other cases, they, they change from, um, from a brownish to a yellowish color for example the ones i i saw and then they have these curious movements that are kind of like contractions that we, we can uh, name them as contractions and uh, once they are ready they start pushing out all of the babies so basically that's the the uh, so it happens in a matter of uh, of some hours sometimes uh, depending the the age of the seahorse if they are uh, just like the, the first pregnancy or they have some a little bit more experience on that so uh they are uh, expelling the babies once they finish in natural conditions it is expected that they uh, wait one or two days before getting another clutch of eggs before getting pregnant again but in captive conditions, like this video here, you will see the female approaches immediately after the male finishes, and uh, she is ready to move, to lay more eggs, to to uh, give more eggs to the male because they have the perfect conditions of food, of temperature, of water uh, quality. So basically, they are just in the best conditions for uh, a continuous uh, mating. Something that I just found out that I think is very, very interesting and super cool is that the males have some modified bones and muscles around the, um, the pouch opening so they can close it and open it uh, willingly. So the females have the same uh, bones and the same muscles attached to 
let's say the anal area or the anal fin. Meanwhile, the males have these same bones and, and muscles elongated and modified to work as a, as a door, as, as a, a closing a, a port here in, in, in the pouch. So if you want to learn more about that, check this uh, other um, paper, this, this other article that I found, and it's very, very interesting. Okay, so after they are born, they have these little tiny size. You can see here the comparison with the with with the point uh, the tip of a um, of a pencil. And sadly, this is when they die the most. There's a survival rate of less than 0.5 percent. So it's uh, quite sad to know that, but that's why they have so many babies in one cloud, and that's why they can mate from uh, basically during spring, all spring and summer. It depends again on the species, but it can be from four months to uh, some species are breeding all year round, 12 months. So this is the size, uh, this is the uh, newborn seahorse, the baby seahorse. And during this stage, uh, about two or three weeks of, of, uh, of life, they belong to the planktonic uh, uh, fauna. So since they since they cannot uh, attach uh, to the to the bottom of this ocean, they are floating around the water. So they are part of the planktonic life. Um, so while there is this um, belief that seahorses mate for life, and that if uh, pa the partner of a seahorse dies, that uh, widow with our seahorse will die of sadness. So that's very romantic, but it's very wrong. Um, there are a lot of studies, there are a lot of studies regarding of this, but this one that I found explains this a little bit easier and, 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 um, and better. Uh, they have a sexual fidelity or, or a, they are loyal to the partner during the breeding season. But even though if in that breeding season, the partner is not suitable, is, is not the fittest, they will look for another partner in the in that same season. So uh, remember always at the end, nature looks for the best, uh, the best genomics, the best, the, the fittest, uh, the fastest, the strongest, is, is the survival or, of the fittest. And uh, in this case, is not the exception. So, uh, when, when we have good genetic pools in both male and females, they will stay together for a whole season, for a whole breeding season or several breeding seasons, so years, let's say. But if one of the partners is a, a low quality partner, they can change even in the same uh, breeding season. So I just have a joke. <laughs> so they are eating for thousands. So they do need to eat a lot. Uh, and they do actually eat a lot. Uh, males, uh, uh, sorry, adult seahorses can eat from three to 50 times a day. But the fry, the baby seahorses, they can eat up to 3,000 brine sheeps or, or plankton uh, uh, individuals uh, a day. So they have to eat that much because they have a very small or an absent stomach. So basically the food passes directly from the mouth to the intestine. It's uh, so, uh, some of the nutrients are absorbed there and then they poop out the, the leftovers. Um, <clears throat> so you can see in this video how fast they move their heads. This, uh, this uh, food that they are eating in this video is mysis, it's a dead shrimp larva. And uh, well, that's the goal when you have seahorses in an, aqu an aquarium to make them eat uh, the dead prey. Uh, because as I mentioned, they are they are predators. So this is a very, very cool video. Well, more like a like a gif rather than a video. Okay. Está. It shows the movement of the head and how fast they they move, uh, they catch the prey. Um, this was a study about the um, structure they have in their heads, in their neck and heads, that makes this kind of like a trigger 
uh, and it moves in well, less than one second, less, less than half of a second. It's something very, very fast. And be, uh, despite being ambush predators, so they just stay in one area and they wait for the prey to come, they have a, a effect, effectiveness rate of 90%. So that means that out of 10 huntings or, or 10, 10 um, tries of hunting, nine are successful. And if we compare that, I was just checking, um, orcas have an 80% of effectiveness, uh, sharks only around 60%, and jaguars only 70%, more or less. So seahorses are more effective when hunting than orcas. Uh, and that's really amazing for uh, this uh, fish that almost doesn't move at all. Okay, another great and amazing adaptation that they have to survive uh, is that their body, their, their skeleton or, or their, their body is covered with these bony plates that are actually kind of like scale, modified scales, let's say, inside the body, uh, under the skin. And uh, most of them have this square or L-shaped form. And basically what helps them um, is the help that they get from, from this kind of uh, arrangement is that they support, they, they can tolerate uh, being squished, let's say, when they are grown up, or they can grab, uh, grasp better from a grass or a coral branch. So this is something very amazing because a lot of um, engineers are checking this structure of the, of the tail specifically to um, to have them printed for robotic arms, for robotic arms, for surgeries, or for things that require to grasp, grasp thing, uh, things more accurately. If you want to know, know a little bit more about that, uh, there's this video, uh, why do seahorses have square tails, that shows, showed you all of this that I'm telling you, and it's, it blows your mind. It's very, very amazing. Okay, of course, they have predators like any other uh, animal. In the, they are part of the food chain. But as I mentioned, uh, these uh, bony plates and this uh, structure, hard structure in their body, prevents them to be eaten most of the time. So in this video, you can see the flounder tried to get the seahorse, but the seahorse just was like, "Oh, where's the boss who ran?" by me so nothing happened you can see and uh, unfortunately when they are eaten is because they are not a target by by the predator but instead they are just like what we say in fisheries a bycatch so predators uh, get the seahorses because they are around what they are eating and well unfortunately humans when we have this um this uh trolling bottom net, uh, catching the, the shrimps mostly, they are part of the bycatch in this uh, kind of uh, fishing arts. Unfortunately, too, we have a still illegal trade of seahorses due to the traditional medicine market or the food market. And as many other animals nowadays, we have <clears throat> a bad uh, the result of the microplastic interacting with seahorses. So there are some studies that show that fries, baby seahorses, already have microplastics because in their in their systems, in their tissues, <coughs> sorry, because um, since they are feeding on very small prey, they are catching microplastic at the same time. So well, if you want to learn uh, more about seahorses or if you want to support uh, conservation projects or learn what is done around your area, as always, check internet, very, very easy to find those areas. But I, if, if you want to go directly to one, I recommend the, sea, the Seahorse Trust. They have a lot of, a lot of uh, conservation campaigns, a lot of education campaigns, and also the project Seahorse. This is also very, very interesting. Or if you are uh, teachers, you can get a lot of resources here in these two pages. 
if you want to be very nerd like me, uh, you can check these um, videos on YouTube on how they evolved, how uh, the tectonic plates uh, gave us seahorses. There's one of PBS here. And uh, these two on the biology, it explains a little bit more on detail about um, all the mating process, all the, the uh, hunting process that they have and on. So I hope that after all of this, you can, uh, you are able to identify the seahorses when you see them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Before we start the Q&A, I wanna remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, let's start with the evolution of seahorses. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Um, do, do they have any um, relationship to real horses, to fish? How, how did they evolve? See, so um, basically, which one is a good one? Here, okay. So oh, I don't have any fish here. Okay, well, just imagine a fish and we have we have the fish and it's in, in this um, horizontal position so ah oh, okay no I, I have one fish here that i can tell you wait a second wait a second right here okay five fish okay five fish is basically a horizontal fish you can see it has the the ventral side the dorsal uh, side uh, this specifically has uh, some radius, radial tail. So basically what happened here is that a regular fish, imagine just a regular shaped fish, evolved into a pie fish, just like this, elongated, very slim. And then uh, thanks to the seagrass beds that were very abundant like 20 million years ago in our oceans, Seahorses were able to go upright. From, they move from being like this, uh, like the pipefish, and then they just move on the upright position like that. So they, they are fish, they tru are truly fish, uh, but the only thing is that they look very different to any other because of the adaptations to their habitat. When they when they evolved those as the decades, uh, um, tens of millions of years ago. And uh, well, basically that's the, the only explanation that we have, that they just evolved from a horizontal regular fish into this vertical position fish. Fascinating. Um, let's see, you mentioned that adult seahorses eat plankton. Does that mm -hmm. mean that that they eat their own offspring when their offspring are in the planktonic stage. It can ha it can happen, yeah. Sometimes uh, there's not a record per se because in natural environments, the babies, as, as long as they are released in the water, the current takes them away. So it's very, very rare, very, uh, not very common for the babies to be around the parents when they are newborns. But mm. uh, if there's a very bad luck, they can end in another species or another seahorse the, the, the intestine. So yeah, it can happen, how long, but it's not very common. How long do seahorses generally live? So in, in uh, in the wild, there is not like an actual uh, register because it's a little bit difficult to track them through their whole lives. Uh, but in captivity, depending on the species, they can live from one to four, five years, more or less. Usually the the bigger species, the, the larger the seahorse, they will live longer. Hmm. Interesting. Do you know of any freshwater seahorses? No, seahorses, no, but pipe fishes. There are freshwater pipe fishes, but not seahorses. And can you have different species of seahorses existing together in a tank or in a little ecosystem? Mm, yeah, it's the, in a tank, of course, yeah, you can, you can get um, 
two or three different species that they are they have like uh, habits uh, behavior in common or, or for example feeding in common or sizes in common you can have those in captivity different este, species but in the wild it is possible as well uh, but they don't they are not together or, or they don't find each other very easily because the density the amount of seahorses that are in a in a given area is very low so basically you have kind of like patches of species in one area. And then right next to that patch, you have another group of, of seahorses, uh, a different species, but they do have like the same distribution or the same, they share the same habitats. Mm. Is the female who laid the eggs in the male, the same female who stays next to the male in labor? Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, in the wild, in some studies that they have done in Australia specifically, they saw um, that when when it's just um, the greet, the daily greetings, when they are not in the courtship, the female is a little bit farther than the male, so maybe I don't know two or three yards away, and they are they have their their territory, and then they have a, an overlapping area where they mate uh, and and they sorry when they're where they meet and then they mate um so when they are in the courtship mating and during the labor they notice that these females in the wild stay closer to the male uh, maybe two yards away if anything in captivity what we have seen is that they basically stay together in every moment in, Sometimes during the day when they are feeding, they might separate, but basically they will stay together in the tank. Hmm. Um, this, this is confusing for a lot of us to understand. What makes a seahorse male a male and a female a female? How was that decided? Okay, so here, as you can see, these two are uh, the same species of seahorse. But um, as, well, in some species, males are a little bit larger, like in this case, in some others, the female is larger. But what you have to see always is, um, let's say we have the head, the neck, and then we have the chest of the seahorse. Well, I think I have this one. Do we have the chest of the seahorse right here? That is on the, on the screen is right here on the slide. Right there is the chest. And then at the very end of the chest, the female will have, let's say, nothing, because you see that it's coming inside. Like you see already the tail. You see the ovipositor and then the, the anal fin and then the tail. So that would be a female. So let's say it's a, it has a flat belly or it has a flat abdomen. It, it doesn't. You cannot see anything in this area right here, but on the male, on the other, on the on the other uh, image here in the very center, you can see there is this smooth pouch because it is a it's, a, it's the pouch, so it is a, this is a smooth um, area. You don't see any the bone plates. You don't see any spikes. Do you notice? And that is the uh, brood pouch that only males have so basically when you see something like that you can immediately tell when they are uh, fully mature they are uh, sexually mature you can tell males from female by that single area over here i don't know if if that's uh, now easier to to identify for example here on this zebra seahorse you can see the chest and then on the abdomen area you don't see an, an a brood pouch. You don't see the uh, abdomen pouch. So this is a female seahorse. Uh, this one that sometimes is confusing with the big the belly seahorse. This is a female. Why? Because you can see the the chest, cha cha cha, and then immediately goes back all the way to the tail. You don't see the abdomen. And on this picture right here, this is a uh, a male of uh, of this uh, this pot belly seahorse, so you can see the abdomen right here. So I don't know if, if that's clearer now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Do okay. seahorses mate across species? I've never heard of that. And I don't, for what I know, I don't think it's possible possible unless they are in captivity. But once again, um, since their genomics are a little bit different from one to another, I don't know if that's like viable in general terms. Mm -hmm. So I've never heard, I've never seen like a, an article talking about that. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the seahorse's eyes? Um, do they point individually in different directions? Do they move yeah, together? Yeah, that's so that's so interesting and amazing. Let me let's put that one. Let's see maybe here, so we can see the the video. So the eyes of the seahorses move independently from each other. They can process the image a little bit independently for, from each other, and they are basically like the chameleon eyes. They are looking for like in this case, food in both sides of the of the body and both sides of the seahorse. And then once they see the prey, they put both both eyes on the prey and then they attack, let's say they, they catch the prey. So yeah, they are independent eyes. They can move independently. They can process image independently. Hmm, fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. are, male, are the males territorial to other males? Or with other males or are the females territorial territorial yeah actually neither of them are territorial um it was thought at the uh, in some areas that they were because uh, you don't see them like overlapping males overlapping with other males but they don't really fight over the territory because um well they don't have like the tools to do so they don't have like teeth or they don't have like uh, fast movements or so. And since they are just, as I mentioned, ambush uh, uh, predators, they can share the same coral branch, just waiting for the prey to pass by and uh, catch them, even if they are two males or two females or four or, or five. So they are not uh, territorial at all. Hmm. Other than mating, do they socialize? or are they mainly solitary fish? They are mainly solitary, actually. So they they don't form uh, schools like other fish do, um, and they don't socialize in any other uh, moment rather than the courtship with the partner, or if it happens that they are in the same spot feeding, but they don't, they don't do more than that. Hmm. Um, getting back to the evolution of the seahorses, where do they fall? Are they older than dinosaurs, as old as dinosaurs? Are they a more recently evolved um, species? Uh, oh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> it, I remember reading they evolved somewhere by the Oligocene. So I think Miocene, oh, that, that was a difficult one because I don't remember <laughs> the, the eons very well, but um, so it was, I think they are more recent than dinosaurs because if I remember correctly, dinosaur appeared like 200 million years ago or so, and these ones appear maximum top 3 million years ago or so. So they are more recent than dinosaur, if I remember correctly. Got it. How do they find their prey? Is it through their sight or do they use echolocation or something else? No, through their sight, actually. They are just watching all the time uh, around the in, in the environment. And once they see, actually I remember, for example, um, seeing one of the seahorses in a lower position than other in, in one of our tanks. And when the one on the top poo, the poo well, was falling in, in front of the seahorse. So they were just like, staring at the pool, checking if it was a prey or, or something. And uh, so, yeah, basically they're just watching all the time. Uh, and what they do is they look for the movement of the prey. Is the, so that's why, uh, I, as I mentioned, it's important for aquarists to uh, have them eating uh, is the frozen food because it's 
it's easier to keep the frozen food, but yeah, they use the ice to catch their prey. They're just waiting for them. Are there any reasons to avoid them? Meaning, do they sting or hurt you if you touch them accidentally? And do they avoid really. humans or get scared? No, neither. You... Okay. So they they don't avoid humans uh, in nature. They, I think, uh, I think the saying is they are oblivious about us. They don't care about us. Um, if you accidentally touch one, grab one, or or step on one. It is very likely they are not harmed and you are not harmed at all because they don't have very, they don't have spines per se. They have like a lot pointy bones, but they are not harmful. Uh, what I'd recommend is that if you see one, either snorkeling or scuba diving, that you just uh, watch them without uh, interfere, without touching them because they can get stressed. And what I saw is that if they are stressed, they can either die because of the stress, or if it's a, a pregnant male, they can abort, or if it's a female and she's ready to lay the eggs, she can, because of the stress, she can is the, expel the eggs to the water and they, that, that's a loss for the individual, for the species. So basically just like, like a thumb roll, just watching, not touching, and that would be it. But yeah, they are, they are harmless. Hmm. Um, what is the most, what presents the most danger to seahorses from a conservation standpoint? Uh, the uh, habitat loss, actually, because uh, mostly because of human alterations and because of uh, the climate change. So basically, they are very sensitive to change in, uh, to temperature changes in the water. So uh, with the warmth of the oceans, they see hotter waters. Uh, so of course it's a it's a a change or a, or a it's the it's a step after the other. Like there's less food, there's less um, seagrass, for example. So basically that would be it. Uh, pollution, is the and and these other two I mentioned. Okay. You had um, said something about the separation of the tectonic plates being part of their evolutionary path. Can you talk more about mm -hmm. that and clarify what you were saying? See, see, actually, yeah, it's one, uh, well, these two videos on top of this slide. And uh, what I uh, uh, say, saw here and, and read in other articles is that uh, the in a moment there were larger, uh, very larger is the, how say say? See, very long, very big areas of uh, seagrass in, in this uh, area of, of uh, South Asia. Uh, so with these shallow waters, with a lot of sunlight coming down, there was uh, this uh, very dense vegetation underwater. Uh, seahorses found the, uh, the perfect habitat. So these specific places were given because of the moving, movement of tectonic plates. So um, I think it is because Australia separated from South Asia or something like that, and then it created these uh, shallow waters in what is now Indonesia, Malaysia, and all these islands over there. So basically that's why they um, scientific is the researchers say that seahorses were uh, or, or existed due to the tectonic plates because because of the movement of the of the continents we had this seabed um, seagrass beds in this area very like massive massive areas hmm. so that's why they mention mm -hmm. is is the survival rate of babies higher in captivity yes. See, it, it, it goes all the way up to like 8% or so. <laughs> yeah, it's something very, very uh, crazy. And that's why it is important to uh, study them a little bit more, how to keep them in, uh, breed them in captivity so we can repopulate areas. In Mexico, there are a, a couple of, uh, or there were some years ago, a couple of projects to do so, uh, one in the Pacific and one in the Atlantic. and uh, 
I think they were successful during the time they did it. So basically, yeah, they, the, the survival rate in captivity is way higher, higher than in the wild. Is there a way to tell if a seahorse was wild caught or bred for the pet trade? Usually when they are, they are, when they are uh, bred in, when they were bred in captivity, they are used to humans. They, you can see them calmer. Uh, the, the movement of their gills is like a re like relax. They see you and they say, "Ah, oh, yeah, another human." And when they are catch from the wild, you can notice a little bit of of uh, stress in the seahorse. Usually, they will try to hide. They will try to to stay still, holding to something, just like pretend being a, a seagrass. Uh, and and eventually, if it's manipulated, they will be stressed, and you will see how they breathe faster. So yeah, that that would be like an easier way to tell one from another. Are many species of um, seahorses endangered? Basically, all of them are uh, in a certain level of uh, of danger or, or endangered in the is the UCNI red list. Um, there's actually for most of the seahorses in the wild, there's a, a not enough data to put them in a in a category of. I mean, all of them are protected, basically worldwide, but um, we don't have enough data to tell. Oh well, this population is declining. This one is is going better. But uh, in general, they are all considered to be threatened, at least, uh, because of uh, the, the reasons I, I mentioned before, like uh, habitat loss, pollution, the climate change. So yeah, all of them. Hmm. So once the seahorses mature and develop the um, scaly um, protection. The bony plates. Mm -hmm. Yes, the bony plates. Um, who are their natural predators? So once they are all grown up, basically only uh, fish, some fish, some uh, like these seagulls, some seabirds, uh, octopus. Octopus can eat them because they have this parrot-like beak that can mm -hmm. uh, break their bodies. Uh, and personally, I have seen them in the stomach of mahi mahis. Fish. Uh, I've seen. A, I think it was a crab holding a, a seahorse, and I remember seeing in, in a tank from from a teacher once a, a seahorse eaten by an anemone. So hmm. all of those can eat them, uh, but at the end, the amount of protein that they have is not like uh, a lot, so they are not a good source of, of food. For most of the of the predators, but well, they are uh, they are preyed mostly because they are in the place where they were where, where the predators were feeding. So the predator mm -hmm. or the, let's say the octopus is not actively looking for a seahorse, but if the seahorse happens to be where the octopus is feeding, it can feed it. It can feed on it. Got it. So if we can find a way for more of those little babies to survive, we'd have a lot of horses <laughs> yes exactly um, that's the key <laughs> so one last question why are the babies called fries i i've never known why in english uh, you name a uh, we call them in spanish alevines uh in in english the the singular for the baby fish in general is fry f-r-y and the plural is fries. So I haven't found the reason for that, but well, it's the technical name. So that's what I would say. <laughs> well, we'll leave it there with a little mystery. Yes, <laughs> uh, Melissa, thank you. That was so fascinating. I'm gonna turn it back to you for some closing comments. Thank you. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed this, uh, this webinar. 
Um, so, well, I hope you all enjoy it. And uh, as I always say, uh, keep watching this, uh, this webinar, your daily dose of, of nature, and uh, just learn a little bit more about the, the animals you like, and you will learn how to, how to protect them. What you can do back home really uh, has a, a, an impact to the world. So thank you. Thanks again, Melissa. And thanks to all of you who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathav.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.